me talk about three obstacles you're going to face when it comes to audacity. You might want to write this down. The next one is, oh, it's right there. It's fear. Audacity compels us to courageously overcome our fear. I can tell you this. Fear is one of the greatest enemies of, of leadership. Let me just ask for a moment of transparency here, of honesty. How many of you have said, you know what, there are things I haven't done because I was afraid. Go ahead and just raise your hand right now. Yeah. How many of you know there was something that you should have done, but you didn't because you were afraid? You should have done it, but you didn't. See, audacity is a critical component. It's a critical role in the life of a leader. I've been there where I've made those decisions. Matter of fact, recently, last year, when God was leading us to make a transition in our life, uh, where we had invested our life for 25 years, and God was saying, listen, I've got something new for you. And we're like, really? Can we? Should we? How does that work? And you go through the whole rhymes and reasons because fear begins to mask itself with what's logical. Fear begins to mask itself in what's reasonable. Fear begins to mask itself in what is explainable. And yet there are oftentimes God says do something and it's not reasonable and it's not logical and you can't put numbers to it. And he says do it. But then we have these voices, these moments of anxiety, the nerves that get to us, the sleepless nights, the, the long days of fear-filled moments. Fear causes us to dumb down our lives. A number of years ago, my son and I, he's 14, he'll be here in just a few moments. Um, we, uh, when he was 14, we kayaked the Grand Canyon, uh, 260 miles of the Grand Canyon, basically from Powell all the way down to Mead. It was an amazing summer. The problem was, this summer, because of all of the rain that they had in Colorado, the river was high, 25,000 CFS. It normally runs anywhere from 8 to 12,000 CFS. That's still a big river. It's, it's still the Colorado. But this summer was double the volume, and it's, and it's had volume of, that far exceeds that. But I remember months in preparation because we had the permit over a year and a half in advance, and so there was lots of preparation and planning that went into it. And, but the closer we got, the more we heard what the water levels were going to be. And I'm the adult kayaker, and I've got two 14-year-old kayakers with me. And then we have three rafts going down uh, with support. And I can tell you, for months, I began to fear the day we put on the river. For months, I started a journey in fear. We started, the river was great. Um, of course, the first part of the river is kind of tame. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, the whole river is beautiful for that matter, but then it gets to where the river is raging. And I can remember a mile, sometimes two miles, you would hear the reverberation through the canyon walls of the rapids. And my heart would just get that fear. But I'm in the river, there's no way out. You gotta run the rapids. But the one that really got me was when we got to Granite Falls. Granite Falls is the first of the big rapids on the Grand Canyon. Um, it's the Grand Canyon has a different scale than we have here. We have a scale of five. Class three waters here is typically what we have up near Taos. Class four, class five, it's very serious water. On the Grand Canyon, so it's a class of 10. This was a class eight rapid. This is the first of the big rapids on the Grand Canyon. I was already scared to death. Now we're already eight days into our trip, nine days into our trip. And now we're facing, you know, Granite Falls. And our lead, on that team, um, made the mistake of having us sleep right next door to Granite Falls. I mean, right off the river. So I slept with fear that night. All I could hear was the rumble of the rapids all night long. Uh, we had camped for the day, and some other rapids came by, or other rafts uh, came by. One of the rafts was a 20-foot raft, one of the big rafts. And literally, one of the rapids, this was the start of Granite Falls, was over 20 feet high, the wave. Was 20 feet high. Massive boat comes in and it stands the raft right on end, straight up, 20 feet tall. And I'm in an eight foot kayak. My son's in a four foot kayak. I'm thinking, there's gonna be big trouble here. Because I'm the safety, I'm the one who's gonna help the kids if they get in trouble. So the next day we put on the river and I had slept with fear, which means I didn't sleep. We put on the river that day, and I remember we had our lines picked. We knew where we were going, but I was the guy who was going to watch out for the kids, and I'm kind of that kind of person anyway. I'm going to be a protector anywhere I go. 
That's what I do. That's who I am. And I remember that morning getting on the river, watching out for the kids, but forgetting to watch out for me. And as we got into the rapids, I could see the kids, and I didn't pay attention to the lateral waves that were rolling off the side of the, the boulders in the canyon, and I went straight into them. I'm upside down in my kayak, and I'm trying to fight to get back up. Tried to get my roll three times, didn't make it. So I punch out of my kayak, and I've got my gear. We're flying through this thing. The most dangerous part of the Grand Canyon is not the rapids themselves. It's actually the eddy lines that are, on, that are below the rapids. The eddy lines are the most fierce eddy lines you're ever going to find. Some of them were like literally a massive toilet bowl that would suck you to the bottom of the river. So I get down, I make it through the rapids, I'm thinking I'm okay, but then I see the eddy lines coming, and that's where I'm really scared now. One of the eddy lines, like this massive toilet bowl, took me down. Now, I've got an eight-foot kayak. This is a creek boat, for those of you that know it's a boat of volume for a kayak. I'm holding on to the stern of my boat, and this takes me to the bottom of the river. And for a moment there, I didn't think I was coming back. Fear. Fear makes you do dumb things. Do you think about that? The effects of fear on a leader. You see, that day what happened for me, I was fear, I'm fearful. I slept through the night. Well, that's not the right word. Through the night, I was fearful. So the next day, it impaired my judgment while I was on the river. See, when we let fear impede what God is asking us to do, it will always impair the decisions that we need to make. Voices of fear. I want us to go to, a, to that point in the, the history of the people of God. Moses is now dead. Joshua is now at the helm. Joshua had watched some amazing things. I want you to see this. To see the sequence. Joshua had seen God do things in the wilderness. He saw how God provided for them. He saw the miracles. He saw the faithfulness of God. Now Moses is gone and it's on him. But it should scare you. When the first thing God says to you, you know, Joshua, you're going to lead the people, and by the way, be courageous. Don't you think that's an indicator? Don't you think you need to say, no, why do I need to be courageous? Isn't this, now here's the assumption we have, God, you're giving us this promised land, right? That's why we've been journeying for so long, you're giving us this promised land, and so, so you're thinking he's giving it to you, but what you don't realize when God says he's giving it to you, he, he means... I'm giving it to you in a way that's going to require something from you. It's going to require audacity. So right here in chapter 1 of Joshua, we see how God speaks to him numerous times. Joshua, be courageous. You're going to be the one to lead these people. Joshua, be courageous. They're standing on the other side of the Jordan. They haven't set foot yet into the Jordan, which, by the way, the Jordan's now at flood stage. So there's some realities now that are sinking in. God's saying, Joshua, be courageous. Be bold. Don't back down. Listen to this verse in, in chapter 1, verse 9 of Joshua. It says, God speaking, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But he repeated it so many times, Joshua had to take a clue. Had to take a clue. But let me ask you to consider something here. Leading with the absence of fear is not reality. I don't know when fear leaves. I don't know when the influences of fear subside. I don't know when. Because I've yet to have that, ex that experience in my life. It seems like every step I take still requires risk. Every step I take still requires the potential of loss and failure. And every step I take still requires a scale of magnitude here that scares me. So leading with the absence of fear is not reality. That's not what we're talking about. Audacity, though, just says, I will not let fear keep me from what God is asking of me. Audacity fuels the courage to overcome our fear. I would suspect today that there might be some of you that are saying, I, I've got a decision to make, and maybe today you'll say, I'm going to make an audacious move. I'm going to take a daring, courageous leap of faith. A number of years ago, when I was struggling with a season of fear, I had, for about three to five years, went through just this horrific season. I turned 40. I'm 47, so this is a couple of years back now when I came out of this. But for five years, I did nothing but lead from a place of failure. I led my organization that way. I led my team that way. Fear-driven on every level. It's not a good way to lead. It's not healthy on any level. 
It's, it's disruptive and it's disruptive. But that was my story for a short season of time. And, but I remember coming to this place and this verse of scripture found in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 where God is speaking to us and he's compelling us and he says this, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. When he says we are not, he's saying those of us who name the name of Christ, those of us who have the, the power of the Holy Spirit, we're, gonna, we're not those who shrink back. We lean forward. We lean in. We don't lean back. We don't shrink back. We lean forward even into our deepest fears. But how often are we shrinking back? Maybe some of the greatest inventions are yet to be made, but they will never be made until somebody is audacious enough to do it. Some of the greatest businesses have never been built yet because somebody isn't audacious enough to start it. Some of the greatest ministries have yet to be launched because somebody is yet to be audacious enough to do it. I did this with a friend of mine because I had to do it myself. I asked him to name his fear. I saw how it was plaguing him. I saw how it was paralyzing his life and his, his, uh, his, the organization that he was leading. I said, you know what I said? I think what we need to do here is you need to name this thing. What is it that's keeping you from doing what God's asking you to do? Put a name to it. Name your fear. It's not fear. It's not the name. It has a specific name. It has a unique name. What is that fear? I grew up as an adoptive child. I was 18 months old when I was adopted by the Wade family born as the result of a backseat pregnancy and a teenage mom tried to take care of me but knew the best for me was to give me to the Wades and I'm so grateful that she did. But let me tell you, as an adoptive kid for 47 years of my life, I have a fear of rejection. Name your fear. I'm a success-oriented guy. I'm a driven guy. I'm the overachiever type A guy. Name your fear. Fear of failure. Name your fear. You see, when you can understand its name, that's when you can defeat it. What is your fear? You see, God wants to give you your heart back. Some of you have lost the courage. Some of you have lost the audacity. You can remember a day when it was awesome. You can remember a day when you did bold things, daring things, heroically took leaps of faith to follow the heart of God, and yet you find yourself stuck. And it might be that stage of life you turn 40, or you turn 50, or you turn 60. Or now you have kids and consequences more. Now you've got employees, and so there's lots of risk. And so now you've got all of these other responsibilities and all of this that could suffer because of a decision you make. Audacity. What is your fear? Name your fear. Here was what God spoke to me in my season of fear. He said, Jerome, fear no one and fear nothing but me. So your fear today of your business not making it is the wrong thing to fear. Maybe your fear is like mine as an adoptive kid of rejection. That's, that's, that's not the right fear. Your, your fear today might be of whether you can make it or survive, whether it's going to happen or not, whether you'll succeed or fail. It's not the right fear. You have to understand, fear nothing and fear no one. But God, wouldn't that change the game? Fear nothing and no one but God. So here's what audacity does. It allows us to courageously, it compels us to courageously overcome our fear. Here's what audacity does. It inspires us to heroically overcome our failure. It inspires us to heroically overcome our failure. Failure. Anybody ever failed here? Let me see your hands. Let me see your short hands. Anybody fail today? I mean, you've been in a perfect world today. You can't fail today, right? Bad decisions, bad behaviors, missteps, mistakes, misdeeds. Uh, not a one of us are clean in our slate today. All of us, as Scripture says, have sinned. Every single one of us. Some of them of greater scales of magnitude and some of less. Some had serious consequences, some had none. Some of them of greater scales of magnitude and some of less. Some had serious consequences, some had none. But I've made so many leadership mistakes in my life 